A very good afternoon for all the members, participants, presence here today with us to celebrate the World Environment Day 2021. My name is Malik Seniratna, a postgraduate research student attached to the Global Disaster Resilience Center, University of Huddersfield, UK. The theme of this, this year's World Environment Day is Ecosystem Restoration. The v World Environment Day 2021 will see the launch of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Restoration can happen in many ways. For example, through actively planning where environmental compatibility is ensured or by removing pressure so that nature can recover on its own. In this process to ecosystem restoration, environmental justice is a key consideration which we all should embrace in our planning practices. Following this main theme, the Institute of Town Planners Sri Lanka has organized today's event to discuss how planners in the Sri Lankan context can intervene to ensure environmental justice amongst the pathway towards sustainable development. For today's session, it is our great pleasure to have the presence of two eminent speakers and a wonderful moderator from whom we all can gain a comprehensive knowledge about environmental justice and sustainable development. It is my honor to mention the names, Dr. Sumudu Atapattu, the Director of Research Centers and Senior Lecturer at the University of Wisconsin, United States of America, Planner Professor P.K.S. Mahanama, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Moratua, Sri Lanka, Dr. Nuan Dias, Research Fellow, in Disaster Resilience at Global Disaster Resilience Center, University of Huddersfield, United Kingdom, to warmly welcome our resource persons and to elaborate on the session's objective. It is my great pleasure to invite the President of the Institute of Town Planner Sri Lanka, Planner Dev Sriyani Jaisundar. Dear Planner Dev Sriyani, it is your time to deliver the welcome speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, good evening everybody, the speakers, members, and all the participants. Uh, I'm honored to deliver this welcome speech on a more important day for Sri Lankans than ever before. Sri Lanka is once known as a country free of disasters. Today, it is listed as a country highly vulnerable to both natural and man-made disasters. It was branded the pearl of the Indian Ocean due to its high biological diversity, the highest in Asia. It is known as the paradise on the planet. However, how long we can hold this prestigious brand name is a growing concern. We are losing our biological diversity at a rapid rate due to unplanned developments. We were so proud of the location of our motherland in the tropics and on international marine and air routes that has provided us with an unimaginable quantum of resources for our development. However, the very same locational advantage has now become a very big issue. Stringent international regulations on marine pollution thought to be the foundation of conserving marine environments. However, the very same stringent regulations have indirectly made Sri Lankan marine waters vulnerable to marine pollution, steered by uh, other nations. And the Institute of Town Planner Sri Lanka, being a responsible professional institute, is committed to playing its role at every possible forum to strengthen the environmental conservation efforts of our nation. With the, that responsibility, the International Affairs Committee and the Center for Urban and Regional Planning, that's the CURP of the Institute, took the initiative to organize this event to commemorate the World Environmental Day, which fell on the 5th of June. And the theme for this year uh, is ecosystem restoration. Due to some ongoing special reasons, the Institute in this webinar focuses on the theme environmental justice and sustainable development. I'm glad to record my appreciation 
to the International Affairs Committee and the Center for Urban and Regional Planning of the ITPSL for organizing this timely webinar to carry forward the Institute's role on environmental conservation. I warmly welcome the eminent speakers, Dr. Sumudu Atapattu and Planner Professor P.K.S. Mahanama and the moderator, Dr. Juan Dias, for accepting our invitation to address this webinar. I'm sure that our participants will benefit significantly from their deliberations. I'm pleased to welcome all the past presidents of the Institute who are present here, the corporate members, including fellow members, associates, and students. And I wish that the participants will enhance the knowledge on the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Planner Dev Sriyani, the President of Institute on Planner Sri Lanka, for warmly welcoming our speakers as well as deliberating on, uh, on, the, on the theme and the objective of today's session. I think now we can move on to today's session about environmental justice and sustainable development. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, or nation, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Of course, the environmental decisions can have major social consequences. One person's environmental protection may be another person's unemployment. I think it is the rightest time that we have this discussion where the entire world is talking about pandemic, climate change, and sustainable development. Let's hear it from our distinguished speakers. To introduce our speakers today, it is my great, great pleasure to invite our wonderful moderator, Dr. Nuan Dias. Dr. Nuan Dias is a research fellow in disaster resilience at Global Disaster Resilience Center, School of Applied Sciences, University of Huddersfield, United Kingdom. He holds a PhD from the University of Huddersfield, United Kingdom, and the master's degree in urban design from University of Salford, United Kingdom. He gained his undergraduate degree in town and country planning from the University of Morocco, Sri Lanka. His extended research experience can be seen in the areas of disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, tsunami early warning within the domain of built environment and planning. Also, he was a team member of developing UK Research Excellence Framework 2021 <clears throat> impact case studies for the University of Huddersfield under the unit of assessment architecture, built environment and planning. Before his project graduate edu education, he worked at the project consultants unit, faculty of architecture, University of Morocco, Sri Lanka. Dr. Nuan Dias is a fellow member of the United Kingdom Higher Education Academy. Dr. Nuan, it is with great pleasure, I invite you to start the session and introduce our distinguished speakers of the day. Thank you. And to our participants, Please avoid any disturbances to the session by staying muted and keep your camera status appropriately. Please use the chat box to forward your questions and engage with the session. I wish a fruitful discussion where we all can enlighten ourselves with environmental justice and sustainable development. Enjoy the session. Thank you. Dr. Nuan, it is your time. Thank you for the introduction, Malik. Good evening to Sri Lanka and good morning to USA. I would like to start moderating this session, taking a quote from Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla Motors. Once he said, we are running the most dangerous experiment in history right now, which is to see how much carbon dioxide the atmosphere can handle before there is an environmental catastrophe. I think this statement clearly justifies why environment justice is important from one key perspective, of course, and why we should focus on sustainable development. So today's discussion on environmental justice and sustainable development is timely and important. And also the recent event, events happening in Sri Lanka as well as globally is setting the exact stage for this discussion. With that, I would like to brief the flow of the discussion today. 
So the flow is first our two keynote speakers will deliver their speeches and then we will move to the panel discussion, which will then be followed by a Q&A from the audience. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we may not be able to post all questions from the audience, but we are trying to have, trying to have, have questions as much as possible. Uh, so while welcoming our distinguished keynote speakers, Dr. Sumudu Atapattu, Professor PK's Mahanama, and his intellectual audience, of course, I would like to kindly note that Dr. Atapattu will need to leave the virtual room exactly at 8.30 p.m. Sri Lanka as in the schedule, because she has come out with some unexpected commitment this morning. So therefore, we will strictly stick on to the allocated schedule. Just wanted to make that note before we proceed. So with that, I would like to invite and introduce Professor Sumudu Atapattu. Let me uh, give a little bit of um, information about Dr. Sumudu Atapattu, about her prominent work. Dr. Sumudu Atapattu is the Director of Research Centers, Senior Lecturer at the University of Wisconsin Madison Law School, United States of America. She teaches in the area of international environment law and climate change and human rights. She holds an LLM and a PhD from the prestigious UK University, Cambridge University, and she's an attorney at law from the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. Dr. Atapattu has received numerous awards and scholarship for academic excellence, including Cambridge Commonwealth Cross Scholarship, and as well as Benefactor Student Award from St. John's College, Cambridge. She is affiliated with the University of Wisconsin Madison's Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, Global Health Institute, the Center for South Asia, and the 4W Initiative, and was a visiting professor in Japan as well as in Germany in several years. Dr. Atapattu has worked on several projects as an independent consultant and as well as a resource, resource person for the UN and she taught several blended learning courses on human rights and environment for human rights officials in South Asia and Southeast Asia. She has many publications in the field of international environment law, environmental rights, and international sustainable development law, and is particularly she is interested on the link between human rights and the environment, especially on climate change. Dr. Sumudu Atapattu, the virtual podium is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuan, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, let me get my slides. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, okay, uh, let's go back. Uh, so today we are here to celebrate the World Environment Day, which fell um, last Saturday. Um, and let me time myself. Um, and um, we all know um, that um, actually um, two months ago, we also celebrated the Earth Day. And I should actually give you a little bit of history to Earth Day because that has a a link with my own university and um, the, when I say the University of Wisconsin and also the state of Wisconsin because the Earth Day was started by the then governor of Wisconsin and uh, Environmental Institute is actually named after him. Um, so we celebrated 50 years um, last year. And um, so why are we celebrating these you know, celebrating the earth or the environment. Um, so why is protecting nature important, right? Um, without um, what nature gives us, we cannot survive. Right? Uh, without the air we breathe, without water, we cannot survive. Our food comes from the environment. We need a conducive climate. Um, and in addition to that, the uh, nature purifies water, decomposes waste. Uh, photosynthesis is another um, function, soil fertility, these are all part of nature, right? 
that although we dedicate two days uh, to celebrate the environment, celebrate nature, we have tampered so much with nature to such an extent that there's a new geologic era named after human beings. Um, and I don't think this is a, a big achievement. It's actually a very negative thing. Um, so these are the ecosystem services that um, uh, the nature provides. Um, so, so what I uh, said just now in a much nicer way, uh, and also we depend on nature and environmental factors for our cultural um, uh, issues as well, cultural uh, rights, uh, aesthetic value, recreation, um, et cetera. Um, so what I would like to do is before um, I get into um, talking about um, environmental justice and sustainable development, I would like to um, zoom out a little bit and see the global picture. And then we will um, talk about Sri Lanka um, as well. So some very sobering facts. Uh, the world has entered a six mass extinction where about 27,000 species vanish every single year and about 1 million species are facing extinction, right? And as we know, when a species is, uh, becomes extinct, uh, it's lost forever. We cannot regenerate it, right? We also know that climate change is accelerating and the temperature increase, which is about one degree um, Celsius right now, um, could reach between three and five degrees Celsius, um, leading to catastrophic consequences. And we are already witnessing the negative consequences of climate change with just a single degree increase in temperature. So imagine what a three to five uh, degree increase in temperature would look like, right? We produce uh, more than 380 million tons of plastic every year, 380 million tons. And I'm ashamed to say United States probably uh, produces um, about uh, the majority of this, right? And if present trends continue, there will be more fish in the ocean than, uh, sorry, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050, right? And since um, World War II, hazardous waste generated increase from 5 million tons to 400 million tons per year. And air pollution kills 7 million people annually and in addition, lack of access to fresh water and sanitation is linked to a 5 million deaths per year. And these are preventable deaths, right? And this list goes on, right? So take a few minutes to see the disruption. Let this sink in how much damage we as human beings, just one species among millions of species, um, has caused to the environment. Yet we uh, make a big deal about the World Environment Day, um, the Earth Day, and then we forget about it, right? And that should not be the case because uh, very soon we probably won't be able to um, survive. So, uh, we have tampered with the environment so much that, as I said earlier, a new geologic era called the Anthropocene um, has emerged, right? Um, because of the devastating and overwhelming impact people have had on the earth and its systems. And we have tampered to such an extent that the natural variability that has exhibited over the last half a million years has been destroyed, right? The equilibrium we have in the environment and the ability for the environment to regenerate itself um, has been tampered with by us, right? And um, the, this magnitude and the rate of change are unprecedented. That is the real problem. It has never um, changed so rapidly. Uh, so, um, I mean, I'm a lawyer. Um, 
how should law and institutions respond to this situation, right? And people are the primary cause of the ecological crisis, right? But when we say that, when we make that general statement, uh, it does not mean that everybody contributed equally to creating this situation, right? This is where the environmental justice framework comes into play because it's really the enormous footprint of the global north that has created this problem. But unfortunately, the footprint of the global south is also increasing. So this disparity is something that we need to take into account, disparity in terms of the contribution to the problem, as well as the consequences of the problem. There is a mismatch there, and that is something that we will be discussing when we discuss um, environmental justice. And if you look at climate change, this is only one of the uh, one of the global threats we are facing: uh, ozone depletion, biodiversity loss, hazardous waste generation. These are all global problems. But I feel that climate change is probably the biggest problem and the most challenging because virtually everything we do contributes to it. And many refer to climate change as an existential threat to humankind. So there is a definition of climate change in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but the most important thing is that it's human activity that has contributed to climate change. And that is important because obviously uh, when it comes to climate, there is a natural variation, but um, it's really human activity that has caused the temperature of the earth to increase permanently, and we are not talking about a day-to-day -day fluctuation in temperature. This is a permanent increase in temperature. And this is how the global average temperatures have increased. And um, right now, this is only up to 2000. Right now, the temperatures are off the chart. Um, and this is the temperature uh, change in the last 50 years. And you can see that the uh, polar regions are um, warming much faster than the rest of the world, which means that all the glaciers are melting and that's contributing to sea level rise, which is a real problem for countries like Sri Lanka and other small island states. And this is where the greenhouse gas emissions um, are coming from. 25% um, is due to electricity and heat. Um, about 20% is from agriculture and land use changes, uh, 17 or 18% from industry, transportation, and then there are other factors like buildings, uh, construction industry, um, et cetera. And you can see from this that virtually everything we do contributes to climate change, which makes it a much um, more difficult thing to, a uh, huge challenge actually to address because where do you target? Do you target the electricity uh, sector or the agriculture sector or industry? Um, unfortunately, because of the um, all pervasive nature of climate change, we have to address all of this at once. So if you look at um, sustainable development, I mean, I'm giving a very, very broad uh, overview. Uh, obviously, I cannot uh, cover these very uh, big um, topics in depth. Um, sustainable development requires policymakers, including town and city planners like yourselves, to balance economic development, environmental protection, and social the, all three aspects have to be balanced, but what happens very often, not just in Sri Lanka, but in many parts of the world, primacy is given to economic development, right? We all know that economic development is important, but it should not be done at the expense of the environment or people, right? And we have many, many examples of human rights violations associated with uh, development activities, as well as massive environmental degradation, uh, again, associated with development activities. 
Um, we know that Sri Lanka has adopted many, many laws. Um, uh, the National Environmental Act of 1980 um, and the amendments of 88. I remember working on this when I was in Sri Lanka, uh, when environmental law was just emerging. Uh, the Coast Conservation Act, the Marine Pollution Prevention Act, I saw a new act has come in the 2000s. We also have a Sustainable Development Act, one of the few countries in the world actually to have a Sustainable Development Act. Uh, we have also adopted tools to give effect to sustainable development. We have um, an environmental protection license um, for industries um, to operate. Um, law also requires environmental ass impact assessments to be prepared, and that includes public participation. Um, and there is um, not a law, but a policy on uh, strategic environmental assessment as well. Um, so overall, we have good laws and tools um, to protect the environment and achieve sustainable development. But um, what happens in practice is something else. So a lot of people refer to uh, or depict uh, sustainable development as a three-legged stool, right? Where environmental, social, and economic factors uh, are depicted as three legs of the stool. And sustainability is uh, supported by these three um, legs. But this has come under a lot of um, criticism because this is how we need to think about sustainable development. In other words, environment is a flow on which both society and economy um, are based. In other words, without the environment, without nature, we cannot have either a society or an economy. But what happens is exactly the other way around. Economy is the big, um circle and um society is uh, is where it is and then environment becomes a small circle right but we have to really rethink um the way we think about the environment and change our mindset and if we think about the environment this way we will realize how important environmental protection is and this shows Without a sound environment, we cannot have a proper economy. Um, so uh, to talk a little bit about the environmental justice movement. So this talks about the disproportionate impact of environmental pollution, uh, especially climate change, um, that the, the disproportionate impact will be borne by those who contributed least to it. So the environmental justice movement originated in the United States in the early 1980s, where it was found that polluting industries and hazardous waste sites are located in racial minority and poor communities. And it con continues even today, despite a lot of work um, that has been done, the situation still exists. And Although you know um, the United States is um, uh, credited with uh, this movement, there are many environmental justice struggles from all over the world. And uh, in 1994, um, President Clinton actually issued an executive order on environmental justice requiring all federal agencies to identify and address the disproportionately high um, adverse health impacts and environmental effects of their um, actions on minority and low-income populations, right? And to develop a strategy for implementing environmental justice. Um, and also to promote non-discrimination in all federal programs. And this uh, executive order continues today. Um, and uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is tasked with implementing uh, this environmental justice, uh, executive order on environmental justice. 
So if you look at the environmental justice framework, um, there are many definitions and uh, it's hard to sort of come up with one single definition, but basically it recognizes the disproportionate impact environmental degradation has on poor marginalized communities, and these are often racial minorities. Um, and um, if you look at Sri Lanka, uh, you might be able to identify some examples um, where um, these environmental uh, problems have a disproportionate impact on poor people um, or marginalized communities. Uh, some have an impact on uh, a disproportionate impact on women, for example. Um, so we really have to identify what these issues are and how we can um, address those disproportionate impacts. Right? And environmental justice is often expressed in human rights language, and we can discuss this um, in the Q&A. Um, and broadly, environmental justice has four components. Um, one is distributive justice, and this requires a fair allocation of benefits and burdens not just imposing burdens on certain communities, right? So fair allocation of both benefits and burdens, because often what happens is certain communities just reap the benefits and leave the burdens to other communities or communities at large, right? Um, the second aspect is procedural justice. Um, this requires open, informed, and exclusive decision-making processes. So getting people involved in the decision-making process is very, very important. Giving them um, sufficient information in a timely manner so that people can come to informed decisions, right? Um, again, we can talk more about it, how we can actually implement this in practice. And I um, referred to the environmental impact assessment process in Sri Lanka. Um, and this is where we have actually um, provided for procedural justice, at least on paper, right? Um, the third component is corrective justice. Um, this requires us to correct past wrongs, right? Either by providing compensation, stopping the wrongdoing act, uh, punishing the wrongdoers, or, you know, making, trying to correct what the wrong deed that has been done, right? And finally, we have um, social justice, which recognizes that environmental struggles are intertwined with struggles for other forms of justice, right? Often economic and social justice aspects underlie environmental struggles. So if you go back to the definition of environmental justice, I said that it recognizes the disproportionate impact on poor marginalized communities, right? And we can see that there is a direct link with social justice aspects, because why are these people poor? Um, why are they disproportionately affected? You know, um, so these aspects are intertwined. So you need to um, adopt a holistic approach to environmental justice, not just to put the environmental issue um, only, but take a wider approach as to economic justice and social justice. It's hard to achieve these in practice because uh, we tend to sort of compartmentalize our um, issues, our problems, and just look at that issue um, only. We don't adopt a wider approach. Um, and then um, if we zoom in, I have been talking about the, uh, the global picture mainly. Uh, if we zoom in on Sri Lanka, obviously uh, climate change has huge impacts on Sri Lanka. Um, the entire coastal um, belt is susceptible to sea level rise. Uh, we depend a lot on tourism and fisheries. All this will be affected, and right now we have a huge um, catastrophe um, in uh, terms of marine pollution. Again, that's affecting tourism and fisheries as well, not just today, but for many, many years to come, right? 
a large number of people in Sri Lanka depend on agriculture as their livelihood, right? And studies show that food security can be severely affected by climate change, not just globally, um, in many parts of the world, including Sri Lanka. Um, export crops um, like tea uh, are highly sensitive to fluctuation in weather. So that's another um, um, impact that we need to um, consider. And um, there's evidence to show that climate change could alter natural systems connecting to the water cycle, ecosystems, and biodiversity of the country. And in the introduction, um, uh, it was referred to, uh, Sri Lanka was referred to as having a high biodiverse um, uh, fauna and flora in, um, in Asia and possibly in the world. Um, that's going to get affected. And then uh, there will be repercussions on human health and human settlements. People might have to be relocated to less harmful areas. Um, and um, there will be impacts on health with uh, warmer temperatures and things like that. There could be increases in dengue um, and uh, vector-borne diseases. And there will be uh, increase in extreme weather events as well. Um, and we, we are already witnessing these extreme weather events. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. And these are some pictures that you are probably um, all too familiar with. Um, so I thought I'll um, talk a little bit about two current examples in Sri Lanka. One is, of course, the expert spell disaster. As you can see, this has caused devastation uh, to the coastal areas and the marine environment. Um, some cleanup efforts, um, the impact on fisheries and marine life, um, and then the port city projects. Of course, the, the early example uh, was an accident uh, within quotation marks. So we don't know all the details right now. At least I don't know all the details. I don't live in Sri Lanka, um, and there are lots of um, different stories going around, so I, I don't know the extent of the, um, the, the truthfulness of those stories. The Port City Project is a planned development activity, right? And these are some examples of, you know, sand mining, um, uh, land reclamation uh, that's taking place. Um, and there are several uh, phases to the Port City project from ocean reclamation to sand mining to transportation of sand, construction of the Port City itself, and constructing a bridge to connect the city to the mainland, as well as, uh, and there's supposed to be a tunnel, right? Um, and the operation of the Port City itself. So you can imagine that, um, the, oops, project of this magnitude will have huge uh, implica environmental implications, right? Um, although uh, uh, an EIA was prepared, it was flawed. Um, many activities were not included. Uh, the, there was no strategic assessment done of the entire project. The um, EIA was done just for the land reclamation. And then it kept on getting bigger and bigger as well. What about the economic uh, viability, sustainability of the project? Uh, we are indebted to China for this project, and uh, we have indebted future generations as well. Um, so the economic sustainability of the project itself is also in question, right? And then the social aspects will it exacerbate the rich and poor divide who is excluded, right? So um, if you try and apply an environmental justice framework to these two examples, distributive justice um, in both these examples, there's a disproportionate burden that's borne by poor people, right? Especially fisher folks those who depend on the fishing industry on a daily basis, 
uh, as well as people who consume fish uh, as their main source of protein, which is the majority of the people, right? Um, so clearly the distributive justice aspect has been uh, uh, when it comes to the Port City project, one of the questions is who is left out of the project, right? Um, who can access the amenity that this um, city is going to offer uh, in the future? Um, so the equality principle under human rights law um, tries to um, give effect to the distributed justice principle. But in certain instances, affirmative action may be necessary to redress past wrongs and to level the playing field, right? When it comes to procedural justice, ensuring that the affected people have a say in the matter and facilitating their participation in the decision-making process is necessary, right? Giving a voice to marginalized communities and divulging correct information in a timely manner. And that is where a lot of governments um, um, don't really fulfill their obligations, right? Correct information is not given. If you try to get information, although we have a freedom of information law in the country, um, information is not given in a timely manner or it's too technical. Um, so the EIA process that I referred to earlier um, tries to give effect to the procedural justice aspect of um, and also to achieve sustainable development, right? So with regard to the Port City project, the EIA itself is flawed and given the magnitude of the project, clearly a, a strategic environmental assessment should have been done for the entire project, right? Not just um, piecemeal, not for parts of it, for the entire project and that was not done. And it should have been, uh, the general public should have been given the relevant information. And also there should have been a big public hearing. Uh, and I'm guessing this was not done from the information I have, I did not see that this was done. Um, and um, international human rights law recognizes these uh, right to information, participation in the decision-making process and access to remedies. And these are also part of environmental rights. So the EIA process embodies these rights. Uh, it's a public EIA is a public document under Sri Lankan law, at least as far as I know. And the project approving agency um, must have the EIA open for a period of 30 days for public comments. And in certain instances, uh, the PPA can also hold a public hearing. When it comes to indigenous people, these requirements are much more stringent. It requires free prior and informed consent in certain instances, particularly if they are going to be relocated from their traditional lands. When it comes to corrective justice, this, as I said, requires um, correcting past wrongs. Compensation may be one form of this. Acknowledging that a wrongful act took place is another, and this is again where most governments are reluctant to admit that they have done something wrong, or you know they haven't done enough to prevent a wrong from happening. Uh, punishing wrongdoers is another, and holding those account responsible accountable is very, very important, right? And to ensure that the same wrong will not happen again in the future, investigating, adopting new laws if necessary and procedures, and even um, establishing institutions might be necessary. So with regard to the Express Pearl incident, I'm sure a lot of you have several questions. Who is responsible? Who will play for, pay for cleanup? What about future damage? What about compensation to those who are affected? Um, fines, punitive damages, these are um, some of the questions that a lot of people have, right? And as we know, um, there has been litigation in relation to both issues. Um, Center for Environmental Justice filed action uh, uh, in both instances, it was the same NGO. Um, the Express Pearl uh, case, which was, a, which was a fundamental rights case, is still pending. It was just filed. 
And with regard to the Port City project, um, the case for uh, writs of certiorari and mandate was, um, was um, dismissed without even notifying the petitioner, right? Um, so in the interest of time, let me, I, I just wanted to quickly uh, give an example of an oil tanker that um, spilled 10 million gallons of crude oil uh, of the course of Alaska in 1990. This was uh, owned by um, Exxon. Uh, Exxon paid several million dollars in punitive damages in addition to cleanup costs and compensation, right? As we know, all ships are required to carry insurance. And after this incident, the International Maritime Organi uh, Organization adopted safety regulations um, and the MARPOL Convention. So um, this is an example where the operator um, had to pay millions of dollars for cleanup as well as punitive damages uh, for what happened. So the social justice aspect, as I said, requires us to adopt an intersectionality approach to addressing these um, injustices. Um, so to conclude, since um, I think I'm time, um, as urban planners, we have a clear responsibility to the people and the environment because what you do um, have um, an um, impact on people and the environment, right? Um, and there's an increasing trend towards uh, designing sustainable and energy efficient buildings and creating green spaces for people. And as we know, sustainable development goals require us to achieve certain milestones by 2030, right? Climate change requires us to reduce our emissions. We have made certain commitments on the international law and um, we have lots of good laws on paper, right? But unfortunately, their implementation leaves a lot to be desired, right? It's a moral and legal responsibility to ensure that our activities do not cause damage to the environment and the people and to reduce choices for our children and grandchildren, right? Um, like COVID, we are in this together. Right, one person um, or a few people cannot do much, right? All disciplines must come together to address the global environmental challenges we are facing. And these global challenges have local impacts, right? As urban planners, we have a great responsibility. And I'm not saying economic development is not necessary. It is important, but it should not be done at the expense of people and the environment. Um, so let's make every day an Earth Day, right? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumudu Adapatu. That was a very informative session, which we uh, started from the global perspective, starting from climate change, sustainable development, and you nicely narrowed it down to the Sri Lankan context and what are the factors, what are, what are the things uh, th that are affecting in Sri Lanka with the current context. So uh, we will move, I'm sure the audience uh, have got some questions for you. So we will move that to the uh, panel discussion. And with that, well, thank you again. Uh, I would like to introduce our second, our next keynote speaker, uh, Professor P.K. Mahanama. Professor P.K. Mahanama, uh, planner Professor P.K. Mahanama is a Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Moratuba. Before his position as the DVC, he worked as the Dean Faculty of Architecture for two consecutive time, 2008 to 2014. Professor Mahanama is a well-recognized urban planning practi practitioner, consultant, as well as an academic in Sri Lanka. Professor Mahanama joined the academic staff of the Faculty of Architecture in 1992. Since then, he's serving at the Department of Town and Country Planning, University of Moratua. He teaches the areas of ecology, environmental planning, and disaster management. 
He holds master's degree from the Department of Town and Country Planning, University of Morotoa, and bachelor's degree from the Department of Geography, University of Kalania. Professor Mahanama is a fellow member of the Institute of Town Planners Sri Lanka, and he served as the president of the Town, Town Planners Institute for two consecutive times. Professor Mahanama has many publications in environmental planning and urban planning. Dear Professor Mahanama, this is your virtual podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuan and everybody. Uh, the president of ITPSL uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, let me share the presentation first. Uh, okay. uh, I would like to. Uh, I'm very really happy to actually speak to the members of the Institute of Town Planners. Uh, as you know, when I so the director, there are about 500 planners uh, in the institute. Out of that, uh, about uh, 200 are uh, practicing planners. So I think uh, the speech delivered by the previous speaker actually be useful for you to consider uh, in the future uh, when you are making the plans. How do you get this, uh, address this environmental justice issue? Uh, let, uh, okay, um, let me. When you talk about structural development, as you all know, it is. Uh, um, about 34 years old definition we are still still using uh, give a second i would get this uh, okay right sustainable development uh, when you take this definition as you all know it is very we use several times this definition uh, all the time. Then we discussed that um, it is introduced by the World Commission of Environment Development. That is implies that say that development that needs uh, needs of the person without compliance ability to future generations to meet their own needs. Now that definition has two aspects, especially the talk about sustainable is a form of development uh, then it has the present generation and the future generation needs to be so when you come to a, a environmental justice because uh, this is actually initiated in 1987 and come down 19, uh, to 1991 92 then then all the time with that uh, this uh, concept but the degradation of the environment and the depletion of resources and increase the environment issues continues without any you know control as you know that when you look at the globally there are many environment issues i think just discussed previously and you all know all this available and you can discuss and you know uh, that indicates something uh, happening uh, globally as well as locally as you know Therefore, they introduced the environmental justice. Why that is came into operation? Because there is injustice happening. So this defines that uh, we have to maintain, have a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people in the development. Any development activity, planning, or whatever thing, there should be a fair treatment. We are doing that or in, in uh, making the uh, that aspect into our planning is the critical issue. So if you, as you know, in Sri Lanka, as a case, uh, we have about uh, around 47 or 50 on environment legislation. One can do a research and see what are, how many laws available. What are they then with having all these regulations? still are not able to tackle most of the prevailing environment issues in the country. So there's something wrong in that whole process. 
So who get the blames? Everybody is, you know, talk about and think, point fingers to the politician, basically. So there is a reason for that. And the professional are excluded. The top, top the people are excluded. People are suffering. That is the end result of outcome of all these issues. So having legal legislation, as you know, that lawyers very well, it is very difficult for the public people to get the consult the lawyers, the professionals to appear behalf of them because all involve the huge transaction cost. Enforcement, very difficult. We know I have practical experience, many development. If you want to enforce your laws, there should be a lot of cost involved. So that has the, then the return you are getting is very it's nominal. So therefore, it is better not to get involved and let the things happen. That's the attitude we are having there. So therefore, we have to consider this environmental sustainable development, environmental justice are within the same frame, same concept, you cannot separate it. Because it is part of the sustainable development. If you want to maintain the sustainable development, achieve the, the objective of that, you have to maintain the environmental justice. So when you, so if you come to Sri Lankan I have some issues. So as you know, when your person if the with the experience in the system, we can find that all the way if you experience so many issues still prevailing. If you and I studied the town planning, I had the same, we yeah, experienced the same problem. 30 years ago, so the same, still the same. It's very difficult. Why is the question that traffic congestion everywhere, especially candy and Columban candy, very specific. You know why we can solve it. Very serious. I'm talking about the injustice in terms of uh, uh, because of the development, there are certain victims, then you're looking for the justice, it's a separate case. But if you are not developing certain, implementing certain proposal, very valuable proposal, the, the all that not implementing also has certain impact on the people are actually suffering with the, uh, you know, their day-to-day -day life. When you look at the traffic congestion, very well we know that, who are the victims? The people are in the, traveling in the private, public transport. About 52% of people are, using public transport, buses and the rail together. So you can imagine, if you go away from Colombo, 30, 30 kilometers away from Colombo, the people have to get up early in the morning, three o'clock, they have to cook everything and get in the bus. By the time they come to the Colombo, maybe late or nine o'clock. So at the same day, in the evening, after office, they are, by the time they are re reaching home, it's around eight o'clock. So what, I mean, towards night. So can you imagine, the injustice for those people, but not having the development, implementation of certain plans initiated by the various professionals and the top, the planners, and even the, the administrators of the authorities, various organizations, they are not implementing, has a certain results in, you know, suffering still, you are suffering. Even your lifetime, you can't enjoy those facilities and the, you are dying with not enjoying that. That is also injustice in a way. So we have to have a kind of uh, responsibility lies in the professionals, how to address that within sustainable development. So how do, what is the reason why it is purely a certain, not the, the, the proposal, not the action, because we are not taking the action at the right time. If you have to take the action at the right time, because we had, there is no, you have to plan the, and take action implementation at the right time. Then only we can give the, certain uh, you know satisfaction or a relief for the people to get their balance part of the life they are accessible to safe drinking water as you know there are water polluters are there but still we can see how many cities are getting 24 hours water supply if you name it colombo you are getting but if you go to away from colombo other cities 
are suffering a safe drinking water. Having so many rivers, having, uh, you know, sea around the country, we were not able to provide water for the people. You go, you go to Gold Minister Council, after five o'clock, you don't get, you have, the water is, you know, you don't get water until next day, five o'clock, the morning. So 12 hours, they cut water. Go to think commonly, they don't have it. Many cities, there's a problem. If you come a little bit away from the cities, the rural areas, people are suffering a lot due to not having drinking water. Where is the problem? It is also environmental injustice. So sustainability, you need, you have to make sure you have to provide safe drinking water. That is not the inadequate basic sanitation. You can show the city places. We had we heard about this during our academic in studying period, 1990, about 30 years ago. We had the same problem is still prevailing in a different form. The waste management, as you all know, is a big problem. Now somehow get managed, but still the problem is remaining in the country. Frequent flooding, as is the serious issue. Everywhere, and there's any heavy rain, we got flooding. Even the slight rain also, we are getting flooding. These are recurrent problems, no solution still. People are suffering. That is, that has to, the, if you look at that, it's a cast color, the poor orange, all are treated equally, this kind of disasters. Spreading of epidemics, serious, dengue, and now it's called COVID-19. So we have not addressed the cities. They are being burning issue in the future and currently. Overcrowding houses and settlement. There are, you can go to many cities, many locations in the city center. You can find overcrowded housing. Crime and safety is serious. Cities are not safe. The crime is uh, the crime is taking place and not safe. That, that is, those are very serious issues in urban planning, issues in the country. So not having proper uh, understanding of the the reality of the picture, real picture of the situation and not i can come to next uh, when i discussion we can say that how why where the where is wrong all these problems we are, you all know but solution are important so these are current problems today the problems that are which are existing today you have to solve this by the next then if you solve this problem definitely the future is bright so some aspects of um, urban planning practice why that happened? Because our approaches are top-down, centralized approach. We make plans top-down. I know I was telling several times, many planners, how many of planners are actually, this is important to know, the planners are actually work, should work in the field and they should plan with the people. They understand the smell and the, you know, all this the smell of the people. So they have to be and, you know, we have to, be with the people. Centralized approach is the top down is not a practice, good practice. All the plans are top down. And you can see when you look at the zone development plans advertised by the authorities, you can see when you look at those plans are actually highly top down and not not talk about uh, you know, the people needs and address. The product oriented, the plan, well, very abstract zoning. I mean, you have to say the reality. So this is why this is a kind of uh, practice we had since we established the authorities. We practice this zoning plan business, but it is very abstract. And even it is a tool that the policy, uh, policy makers, the politician can manipulate. Zoning is there, but the decision is taking in a different way at the with the, with the support of the planning committee approval you can change any zoning and approve those is this is we found that many places all of that there is one other thing other is start and consensus of power to enforce you don't have that this power to enforce because that is also a serious issue because the planning separate from implementation budgeting we don't have money to implement plan plans there and they are actually the sales the activity is taking place with respect to the planning. That is also the, the re, one of the reasons that the plans are not properly implemented because there's something wrong in the planning because budgeting is money is not there, the plan is there. So that's also one of the things that comprehensive plans, all the plans are very comprehensive 
a lot of data and modeling and highly technical, highly technical. We know that some of the model, uh, modeling actually is very important for uh, the certain things you need that technological technique use. End of the day, the people are using model for manipulation also. So then people, general public doesn't know anything about that. So no, how many people, only professionals can, scientists can understand, others cannot. So it is, it has certain um, uh, issues in the form of inclusive or exclusiveness. The limited or political motivated assessment of situation, that's also there. When you have decision making, assume current trends will continue same in the future. So there's also a prediction estimates, estimates are very sometimes not realistic. Based on the statistic, we predict, uh, predict not understand the future directions. The, based on large amount of data and the st no stakeholder engagement, it's very important to understand. The data actually are depend on the, the reliability and the accuracy, but they are most of the data are not accurate and not reliable. But the decision I'm making based on the data, so then you can understand the, the results. Therefore, a stakeholder engagement is necessary, you know, not there. Then as major orientation and awareness, and even the implementation by director. Those are the, some of the practices we are having right now. Uh, uh, important thing I mentioned here, so that has certain impact on maintaining the justice, the environment justice, and the sustainable develop, urban development. So we have to rethink, uh, uh, re think how to do the future. And when you understand some of the development projects which are in urban nature, so there are people actually come to the street and make objection, protest. And that indicate they wanted environmental justice as well as social justice. So have we, have we considered them? When you are developing a uh, road trace, this is the first case, Talangama tank area, that is because the elevated highway, they are going to construct elevated highway from Atulgiria to uh, Paliagoda. There was a proposal of light trail that was abandoned. And light rail, again, the highway, highway is an exclusive expressway. It's only the certain uh, people get privilege. But uh, the people actually had to uh, sacrifice their properties, land, everything to, for this road. But the benefit they are getting, nothing. They are getting the, the negative impacts. You all know that expressway can, can be expressway constructed recently. The Gampa, many part of the Gampa got underwater. That is, I think, we have to make sure uh, that this is just these people actually expect from the uh, policymakers as well as the authorities and the people, the professionals. So where have we went wrong? So if you really identify the impact assessment done properly, they should be able to avoid this why that did not happen why don't I, they, these are all professionals are doing this the eia and everything all the studies when you do the studies they should be able to identify the potential issues if you are putting the trace so they are they are actually not done properly or not they know that but they are hiding it or they're ignoring it because of the cost of development so it is better now to understand the maintain justice cost every action has a cost that cost actually cannot be compromised with the damages that they're expecting in the future therefore the cost has if you want the road development then the development needs they have to spend that cost who need this development the people need I, that's the question again the people are are there people requesting this type of development no who decide decide by the rda development authority so they actually they decide they think that these are the people no people doesn't want some time they assume that they want this they're predicting and planning it because these authorities has to be survived their life in the organization because these are some of the problems you are facing there was organization like previously the name called land reclamation and development corporation that the before that is a colombo land reclamation development board so they created the board to reclaim lands. So you can imagine 1965, 
the country, the wetlands were considered as wasteland. Now, when you now what happened now, the until recent, it was named as the wetland, the land reclamation and development corporation. That's the government is investing money to reclaim the lands. But now we have changed for land development corporation. So now they are still they are doing the same business, but in a different way. So that is anyway, that's that's something you have to understand. So the present practice, that is not the totally the fault of the politicians. The politicians are advised by the professionals and the people are in the, uh, the, the position of the organization, they advise the politician. So they have to make sure that, that we have to understand their, in your, our action, our recommendation, our proposal has impact on the society, the all segments. If you want to maintain environmental justice, the justice had to, we should not only target the politician, but we have to consider whether the professionals have done their job because they are governed by, the, our planners are governed by the three important laws actually. Urban Development Authority Law, Town and County Planning Ordinance, and the Town and House Housing Improvement Ordinance. They are basically the physical planning planners, the physical planning direction is given by these three laws. So that is, I think, uh, you know, understand under that laws, any mistake done by the planners has to be targeted and they should be responsible, they will be accountable. So therefore, it cannot be simply the other's fault. Because that is the then you can expect justice from their side. So there's a protections required, everything or insurance setup must be there, but it's not happening right now. There are good proposals sometimes, people not accepting. We know there are certain good proposals, people relax, people get misguided. So that's also part of the fault of the professional because they have they are not they are ignoring the people, the recipient of the development. That I think very important. Do that rethink all the planners, young planners has to consider what is your role basically had to be very much clear. Then you know, after some time, the you know, over the time, the UN has also struggling. They are putting certain thing, changing and sustainable develop to MDGs, now comes sustainable development goals. Anyway, these are very, are very good in terms of documentation and preparation. There people have to follow everything. Country need to, uh, to put this buzzword, otherwise you don't get funding for the UNS. Now you know they are also uh, targeting and they are also having certain issues to survival. So it's very realistic. I mean, it's natural. You can understand if something not nobody follows the rules and regulations, suggestions they are main, maintained, but people are and the country is going ahead the way they want. So that's sorry. So one of the critical uh, the under 17 government sustainable goals, they mentioned about sustainable cities and communities. So that's very important to understand. The their targets are very important, as you know. I'm not going to read all these things. The targets they are given uh, 11 the targets, 17 targets, 10 tar 11 targets. All expect that the they wanted to make the maintain the environmental justice and the sustainable development. So the, the underlying uh, the concept of these targets are the inclusiveness. But they talk about inclusive. You must be developed. Everything, any city should be inclusive. So the, the question is that our plans, are, our actions are not inclusive. That's what we are facing all those problems. Because there's a physical and spatial exclusion. There's a interurban inequalities. So you can see that there are slums, non-slum areas, public amenities are not uh, equally distributed. People are not having the same services. Why? Some people get the water adequate, some are not getting. Is it not? It's not a good thing. It's, there's, a, there's a very clear exclusion. They understand the, the required what the facilities should be given. Economic exclusion, there are people, informal sector, formal sector, people are getting the, the lot of things. Uh, I mean, uh, some people are excluded. They are not allowed to do that. They are not accepting, so therefore very important for you to understand that. Then a social exclusion, as you know, the cities, area, it's a multi-ethnic country. There are certain, there's, you know, 
uh, ethnic uh, divisions are there and there are disabilities also a lot of other, and you have to understand the the exclusion is prevailing in the many cities of the country even the, not in uh, sri lanka in many countries in the the third world countries basically they are they are there so because there's uh, these people are not smart enough or not prepared to put their you know in their justice to the uh, policy makers or decision makers policy everybody they just uh, keep quiet they are they, they are suffering with that and um, they live with that that's what happened because they are they are they are not that they are not empowered or they are not they don't have a capacity to address that so therefore the in inclusion is very important so at inclusive cities so should have a framework there should be a physical inclusion social inclusion economic these are very important to make the very in make a create a inclusive i think the planners should understand you have to include every, everything in terms of you know put a three three areas physical inclusion um, though you have to have the understand their physical requirement and the socially that they are social requirement they are, they are you know various so we have to make sure that they are included they are not marginalized we cannot call them in a city marginalized people poor people so we cannot call them because they are part of the city they have the certain uh, roles to play so they are important uh, segment of the society so make sure they have to put everything all are included in our plan and just also have to put that i think as a message i would like to allow you to have a discussion with them on yourself how do you create a send then how can you do that how can you practice that understand then i'm taking two important pictures here one is the uh, goal face other one is the uh, arcade long term face you can see which one is more inclusive which one is not more inclusive so goal face green is a very inclusive place you can count number of people you don't know what people there so they are interacting with each other and it's a very comfortable place for people there is no one is excluded or like having game in and when you go to arcade you there's no any, any restriction but you are excluded because of the functions available in the that particular location if similar functions are in the golf face people won't go there that's the that's the nature so golf is green is you can hear if you look at the land value point of view it is highly valuable land we don't know in the future what going to happen but currently the golf face is very protective it is a place for all the citizens of sri lanka they would nobody question you where you come from which caste which fair which color no nobody cares even the foreigners come nobody cares because they all get the same feeling living in same the public place so you can understand public places must be inclusive it should not be exclusive so that is what the message i want to do so when you take this uh, triangle so if you put this uh, uh, concept of uh, what they call sustainable development and um, environmental justice put a triangle is called town the planners triangle though when you take the equity as the top social justice so equity is very important for all the time aspects the national level regional level and the local level where you need the people that have equity so there can't be any poor people living in any location that can be definitely we can address that if you know the real poor your poverty why they are poor we have address so we have to maintain that then economic development so then the environment protection that is the conventional triangle we use for sustainable development when you look at that the conflicts are there property conflicts development conflicts and resource conflicts this is the why the injustice happen so it is our rights our our the professionals rights to ma minimize that conflicts and make sure social welfare and everything has to be maintained and i have to put that with the concept of inclusive cities you can consider this the three aspects 
including an economy development, environment protection, and you can have a better plan with that you know combination of this is the plan of strangle you can think about more can add more things and so what i'm putting at the bottom one and say past present future now we know that it is the uh, everybody you know in the law we are the buddhist i mean i'm the lord buddha says the present is more important if you do something good or bad in the present definitely your future is disaster then you have past also disaster. So your past actually are there. You can understand the, what you have done, the mistakes, everything. You can you know the what happened in the past. So everything. Then the you know present, but see, but you know you don't know the future. That's the, my my personal understanding of this sustainable development is actually means the future needs of the society. So who knows that, how, what is the taste and preference of the future generation? It's very difficult to put. So we can see the near future, but long future is very difficult. If you plan for 30 years, 10 years, 15 years, we don't know what could happen. Why so much long time, long term plans is required without knowing the future generation, how they live? Do you want to expect to live like what we want? No, that's totally wrong. The present generation, the present, if you plan present, if you wisely use your resources, if you plan the cities, understanding the structure, city structure, you know, rearrange the space of the to accommodate the present need of the people is the first priority. That doesn't mean you have to consume all the resources and don't think about it. No, that auto, if you really use resource wisely, definitely the future is better. So that's why you know is a this moment is very important. This moment, management and planning of this moment is very important. And it is important because the reason is why if you are not really planning this and there's injustice happen because people are actually not enjoying that. And they are actually preserving or conserving or they are not, you know, very not in a proper way. I'm talking you have to conserve and preserve is important. But if you are not getting your you are sacrificing your life, it's also important. therefore to understand that your sustainable development has to, if you want to achieve the better results, your present consumption, present uh, the, the development, present activities should be, you know, done more wisely and, you know, with a kind of um, integrated and, you know, understanding inclusive, all these concepts are important to live there. Your present plan, understand the present problem, solve that problem and don't waste your resources and uh, use the resources and keep that the life short life you know keep that life period for a short immediate future but but don't think that next generation will keep them who knows that the next generation comes and sell their properties so can you stop that no so that is what i understand in the past what happened if you count all the incidents happened since uh, you know independence you can see the columbus in fact cabo Combi and all these kids and all these people actually came to develop uh, certain locations you are celebrating 100 years so can you imagine since 100 years of what had happened it each time the now you they preserve something keep that next generation to come and destroy or sell it so that I think we are very important. I'm telling the message that you are understand. If you plan present current situation properly, the future is actually because future is definitely good in your the the then you don't find any injustice um, in your development. So so that is uh, sorry. Thank you. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, I, I will conclude with this uh, Lord Buddha's teaching. All conditioned things are impermanent. When one sees this with wisdom, one turns away from suffering. I'm not saying that. Uh, that means in Buddhism, we call anicca. So impermanent. So we understand everything, all the conditions of the environment, life, physical things, all are 
not permanent, they are impermanent. So when you are planning for a, under, assuming that everything is permanent, static, then we are, in, we are actually in your own direction. So understand the, there's a dynamic, the things, there's a dynamism, the changing is the, changing is the, the real, real things. So if you can plan, understanding that impermanent, uh, we are planning for impermanent uh, situation or conditions, then actually we are, we are doing a better planning and we can, suffer, we can minimize the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mahanama. I think it's very uh, interactive in, in terms of starting from the Sri Lankan context, current issues, and uh, what's actually happening in Sri Lanka. So it's more Sri Lankan context-oriented, So which, which is very useful for the planners in Sri Lanka, since the audience is urban planners in Sri Lanka. So with this, we can move to the panel discussion. But as I said, we have a strict time restriction for Dr. Sumudu as she needs to really uh, leave the session. So I think if Professor Mahana permits me, I will uh, ask some panel questions from Prof uh, Dr. Sumudu first. And after that, if she needs to leave, she will be able to leave the room and then uh, we will uh, come to Professor Mahana with the panel discussion. Uh, sorry about the uh, time constraint. And in that case, if we if we are not able to leave uh, more questions for Dr. Sumudu, what we can do is we can have them and uh, email her later for a discussion. So with that, uh, I would like to move on to uh, Dr. Sumudu. Uh, so you spoke about uh, the climate change adaptation and sustainable development. So. Uh, with sustainable development, my view is, as I have worked on several areas on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction as well. So it seems like climate change, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable development or urban development are, are three sides in, in one same document or one same uh, coin, let's say. So in with that scenario, because this is Sri Lankan context, so how the urban planner policymaker in Sri Lanka, they can integrate climate change adaptation with the sustainable development. What are the requests? What is missing in the current Sri Lankan context in order to integrate climate change adaptation with the sustainable development context? I would like to uh, have some views from you, Dr. Sumbu. Thank you for that question, Nuan. Um, I will give you an example. Um, in the Port City project, Right, I mean, this is uh, an ocean reclamation project and Sri Lanka, as we know, is an island nation, right? Susceptible to sea level rise. But the environmental impact assessment prepared for that Port City project does not even mention climate change. Does not even, I mean, it's unfathomable to me that a project of that nature, and given Sri Lanka's geography, and given all the predictions with regard to climate change, the environmental impact assessment done for that project does not even mention climate change. So if you don't factor that into the environmental impact assessment, how can you plan for that, right? That, that's crucial. And when we know that this is going to happen, we might not know the exact magnitude, right? We are putting, so that this is why I said we need to look at these issues holistically. If we don't, and this is often what happens, not just in Sri Lanka, but all over the world, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And we spend so much money um, doing certain things, and then several years later, we have to undo them. Just take something simple as a road development project, right? We do this, we pave the road really, really nicely, and then two years later, somebody, uh, the electricity department or the water board or whatever it is, comes and digs it up. Why? Because we did not talk to those guys before we did that, right? So takes those simple examples and, you know, we can learn so much from our mistakes, but we never do, right? So when it comes to climate change adaptation and development projects, if the development projects do not take climate change conse uh, consequences into consideration, it's so short-sighted, right? 
let's say the project is to uh, you know the port city project is a good example but let's say it's um, uh, some agricultural project right and it's in a floodplain area if we don't factor that into consideration what's the use of putting a lot of money into that agricultural project or um, developing a fantastic building if it gets flooded people cannot use it right so there are lots of things that we do not take into consideration which we should be doing and um as uh, professor mahanam said you know, we need to take a more longer term view of development. I mean, let's, and he, he mentioned the fact that this is, an, uh, this is a critique, a lot of people say of sustainable development, that we don't really know what the future generation's needs are. We don't need to know those, right? We don't need to know what their needs are, but at least leave them some choices, right? Look at sustainable development as a bank account. This is something one of my own students said when I was talking about sustainable development. She said, think of it as a bank account. Will you spend everything in your bank account today and forget about tomorrow? That's exactly what we are doing. With regard to the environment, we are spending all our resources today without thinking about tomorrow. We don't need to know what the future generation's needs are, right? But we need to ensure that they have some choices left, they have some resources left without emptying a bank account today. That's what is sustainability. That's what, what needs to happen. So I think you are positioning this uh, issue with uh, non-coordination between the organization and institutional chaos, communication barriers yeah. in that viewpoint. So with that, like, is there a role that urban planner in Sri Lanka can support to, uh, I mean, at least to reduce this scenario? Is there anything that the urban planner can do from your point of view as a lawyer from a, uh, who is engaging in policy making? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the thing is this, you know, I mean, if you look at our institutions, they are all siloed, not just in Sri Lanka, everywhere it's like that, right? So we need to break those silos because we are, we tend to think in those compartments. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying it in a negative way, that's how we are trained, right? But when it comes to something like environment, something like climate change, we can no longer do that, right? We, we need to have all decks on board, all hands on decks on hand or hands on deck, right? Um, because when I showed you that slide uh, about where these um, emissions are coming from, it's every part of our economy. We cannot just look at, okay, I'm only doing urban planning, right? I don't need to worry about agriculture. I don't need to worry about, I don't know, waste disposal or whatever, right? We can no longer do that because climate change has affected everything. And we need to adopt not just a long-term approach, but a more holistic approach. And that means we need to talk to other disciplines. We need to talk to other departments. And that's something we are very bad at doing. I can give you another example. When I was doing those training workshops, um, a lot of people didn't know, a lot of people who work on NDCs, these are um, emission um, targets, commitments that states have made, nationally determined contributions. They have absolutely no idea about human rights, right? they don't realize that their work could have an impact on human rights. Vice versa, people who are working on human rights had no idea about the commitments that states have made with regard to climate change, right? Those commitments have a direct impact on people, right? So that's why it's very important to adopt this macro uh, holistic approach um, and, talk to each other 
as I said, you know, we, we never do that because, you know, two years later, we go and dig up the same area. Two years later, somebody else will come and dig it up because we don't talk to each other. And it's very important to have these interagency, interdepartmental uh, coalitions and um, um, working groups to address this situation. Thank you, Dr. Adapato. I think you set the stage into the exact correct point for the young planners and the planners to begin with, where, where they should begin with to break these silos. So mm -hmm. with that, I know you got only absolutely four minutes to for this discussion. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I apologize for that. This is something totally unexpected that happened and I have to go. Plan. Yeah, so <laughs> at least we, we are very thankful you are still here. So... I think I will just raise one question from the audience and you can uh, actually uh, give a short answer for that. There's a question from the audience. They are asking that the developed countries like US, UK and mm -hmm. EU, these countries have done uh, great damage to the environment historically. And mm -hmm. with historically damage, now they are talking about the environment justice and sustainable development. So the question is, is it okay to pressurize these developing countries saying on this aspect? And on the other hand, the question asks, uh, what are the things or what are the actions that these developed countries, you can talk about the US situation, mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. taken in order to uh, pay for these uh, previous mistakes? Or what are right. the actions that mm -hmm. they have taken? Mm -hmm. So there are two aspects to that, right? One is about holding the countries that are disproportionately responsible for the damage they have caused. That's one aspect of this. The second aspect is the way we develop. As developing countries, the way we develop, um, the argument is that because of the choices that these developed countries have made, the choices that are left to us are limited, right? Uh, so that's another issue. Um, so with regard to the first one, um, I totally agree. I mean, uh, when it comes to climate change, United States is historically responsible for one fourth of all greenhouse gas emissions ever. I mean, since the Industrial Revolution, right? One fourth, that's a lot. But, I mean, particularly during the last administration, nothing was done about climate change. In fact, a lot of the uh, regulations were rolled back, right? Uh, we pulled out of the Paris Agreement. So, and the, the way international law is set up, it's very hard to hold states accountable legally, right? Uh, particularly for a global environmental problem like climate change. Um, because, you know, how do you establish that the damage you're suffering is due to the uh, emissions of the United States? It's impossible to do that. But it's responsible for one fourth. So it should be held accountable, not if not legally, but otherwise maybe paying to a fund. There are lots of different funds that have been set up at the international level where these uh, countries are paying into not as way of a legal obligation, but in order to help the adaptation fund, the least country developed fund, most of those funds are coming from developed countries, right? So that's one aspect. And also the legal uh, framework is based on this common but differentiated responsibility principle, which means that those who are more responsible had more commitments under the Kyoto Protocol, right? It's different under the Paris Agreement because they went for voluntary uh, commitments. The second aspect is more complicated because what's happening is developing countries are looking to the development model of developed countries and think that that's what we should aspire to. That's where sustainability comes into the picture because how developed countries develop was totally unsustainable. And that's why we are in this mess, but that does not mean that we should make the same mistakes. And unfortunately, we are making the same mistakes, right? So look at those mistakes, make things better. Things are much better now in terms of technology, in terms of, you know, media, social media. Everything is easier than it was 10, 15 years ago, right? So let's not make the same mistakes. 
Let's make things much more sustainable. Um, not look at capitalism and what um, the West has achieved as the standard to aspire to, because it's totally unsustainable. I'm not saying that we have to achieve a certain standard of living that's totally necessary and very important. Uh, once we do that and how we do that is very, very important, right? Make sure that we um, comply with sustainability and environmental justice principles when, when we try to get there, right? So with that, I will stop. Unfortunately, I have to run. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, and I'm really sorry again for leaving midway. But as I said, I have to attend this funeral, which was totally unexpected. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumudu. But we really appreciate even you have some commitment. You just joined today and actually you have uh, staying uh, staying apart from the time you actually promised. So thank you very much for joining. And uh, we congratulate for you for your future work and your future uh, activities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now with that, uh, thank you, Professor Mohanam. So you, are, you have been waiting for the panel discussion. So uh, now I would like to start the panel discussion with Professor Mohanam. And um, with Professor Mohanam, if I start with, because you have been discussing about the uh, Sri Lankan context and uh, the issues in the Sri Lankan context, it's more oriented to the uh, actual implementation level of Sri Lanka. Since the audience, audience is urban planners who act actively engaged in the urban plan. And I think uh, a question with uh, about the economic development and environment conservation, which is linking, will be uh, will be helpful for the for the uh, urban planners. So my question is, should urban planner first think about economic development and then environment conservation or environment conservation and then economic development? How should a young planner maybe position this position themselves, whether they should try to help with the economic development or environment development, or what is the best method to balance these economic, social, physical aspects, which actually have came with that model, say in social, economic and environment aspect. So I think if you can give some further comments on further ideas of you as experience plan in Sri Lanka, I think it will be really helpful for these uh, young plan especially to uh, get some insights on how to balance these development in all aspects. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's very important, uh, you know, uh, economic development or environment conservation, but uh, we should understand which one is more priority actually. Now, as a country wise, we know that country is now having a serious economic problem. The old aspects, uh, they are taking right now to increase the economic growth and uh, they are having a lot of macroeconomic problems that boil down to the cities definitely cities become the engine of economic growth we always say there's a ab ability and the, uh, the potentials are there in the cities every city has a potential so that um, if you ask question i already say is the priority is economy development that's no question so west telling us that to your, your priorities environment, why should we, our priorities is going to be right now. So anything you should do, you have, the people must get income. Everybody should have income, money, their hands to, to satisfy their life. Because they are living in a very short time period. That short time period, they need all this. Resources. But that doesn't mean you are going to ruin the environment. You have to integrate, integrate the environment with the economic development. How do you do it? It's nice you can do. You understand the cities. There's a structure already given by the nature. So we know that we can call it, uh, we cannot call it environment, natural and built, but it's a, it's a element, natural element sign the environment. They are very important. That's the structure given. So what is your responsibility? When you have become a plan in the city, you must understand, go to the site, go to the city and understand what is the structure. Then you know that the structure has the, all the elements, what you are talking about, then elements, natural elements, physical element, all these are there, and understand, identify, they layer them, layer, they layer them properly, 
and understand the capacities, the strength of the people, whether you can have the economy, what type of economic growth. So what is the capacity, carrying capacity, everything you should know. Then only you can plan integrating, not doing, but you can integrate, to other, you can rearrange the space in the city to keep in the environment intact with the development. So I think that is very clear, but the planner should get that first-hand physical, real-world, real-time experience. Otherwise, you don't do plan in the office. You must be in the field. And your people should know each and every person. You are a plan of that particular area. You can talk to the people, go to the people, each and every house, and identify the issues and say, and visit the, every point of the land area. So understand the interaction of them. Nothing is standalone. They are connected. So then you can easily plan, nicely plan with the, on the in terms of, I mentioned that inclusiveness, very important. It should be an inclusive plan rather than exclusion. I think that is my message I can tell you about that, basically. Yeah. I think, Professor Mahanava, since the beginning you have been talking about this inclusiveness and uh, engagement of uh, the recipient. So what are the community engagement or community participation models or methods in Sri Lanka in practice? We know there are several methods and practices in theory, but how are they being applied in the Sri Lankan context? What should the young planners or the other planners should do in order to uh, bring these community engagement models or methods into practice? Is there anything that they should do? What is missing in that sense? I think um, the, there are many uh, tools are available. You can adapt. There are tools are developed by many parts and even the university was teaching the community action planning, a very lot of other things. And you can, but you know, the environmental participation, you know, you are living in the West uh, country, you know that these countries are the public participation in a high level. So, so we, no one can do anything without uh, the, getting the public consent. They have the right to, there's a legal right as well as the social, yeah, they all know. Here we don't know anything. Even I am living in Aturgiriya next to the intersection, but I don't know anything that uh, new road, where to start, what's going to happen. So, you know, being a uh, living, and uh, I, I don't, because I can find it through the document, but that's a right to the plan who are living that area. They should come and tell us the people. Now, this is the way people have different, uh, you know, I mean, this is the situation. So the, the, there are a lot of tools. You can talk, talk to the people and the stakeholders. You understand what the stakeholders the particular city and you have to summon them in a place. No, no one is objecting you. I think all the, if the people are, they are very innocent, they are very, they are listening to, I know I practically, I talk to them, you know, in the, do the Nigambo, the, to become the Nigambo Lagoon as the, to create as a uh, authority. I mean, the fishing area, legalized, gasseted, we had 20, about 30 odd uh, workshops this fishermen to understand the function of the lagoon and the sea. So I can remember Dr. Samarpa and myself, every Sunday, we visited the Nigambo city, around the Nigambo uh, lagoon and talked to the people, fishermen, and explained that. So the, they, are, they are arguing that they got the, all these prawns are in the lagoon, but we say they know that is not the case. We, that is coming from, has a relation with the sea. So you can understand uh, that is that is all, but they listen. And uh, they actually finally, we, we are able to create the Nikambu Lagoon as a protection area. Now the, the, all the fishermen, lagoon fishermen are very happy. Now they are the, we gave kind of direction and they went to the top level and got that uh, the, in the declaration. So similarly, the planners can do a lot of uh, things with the people. I mean, the different stakeholders, so there's a, there are tools. I think I my I'm, I know that planners as a, a very very important profession. They should understand the fish, all these problems and the future direction can be solved with the physical planning. If you really understand, if you really uh, engage, so you can change all these. Uh, you know by adjusting by changing the you know physical setting. You can achieve the, all this development, uh, what we're expecting. So Western countries doing very well. You know, I, we, hope we have got experience. And Singapore is doing very well. They are very well planned and they have the very systematic way. And only we are actually um, having that problem because uh, we lost our connection. I think that is what we want to have.
Yeah, there are tools available. I want to name that many tools available. If the person want to search, we can help it. The UN Habitat done a lot of uh, work, and there are documents available on the net. You can use it, and no harm actually conducting the environment plan, sustainable city development program. There's environment planning and management mechanism, and their action planning. A lot of things are there as tools. Only thing you have to use their tools and get your plan and be comfortable to make a good uh, professional plan. That's the professional. Professional lesson means you are sitting in the office and doing planning. That is wrong. That was not correct. You look at that hundred years ago and Patrick Geddes and Apocombe, they did plan like that. No, they were in this. They, when you look at their biography, they were all the time in the site working with. So that is that is what uh, to see. Right. I think that is okay. I think, Professor Manu, that is very insightful, and you are you are exactly right about the community engagement in developed countries. In, in even in my context, I developed a model for community engagement in with live uh, urban design projects. So here, the even though people we think we they don't have much knowledge, they are very much knowledgeable. I have spoken to them personally, and they have sometimes their knowledge inheriting from their generation to generation. So it is very helpful to get their ideas and they exactly know what they really need rather than we are going as strangers and implementing some uh, development. So I think that's a very uh, insightful uh, uh, talk on how we should integrate this uh, inclusiveness in our city planning. So with that, Professor Mahanam, I would like to uh, get one other question from the audience. So the audience has a question, uh, how are the general public comments are evaluated? Again, it's linking with your, your initial views. Uh, how are the general public comments are evaluated in the EIA process in Sri Lanka? Do you think the EIA process has sufficient awareness and trust by the people of Sri Lanka? I think it's uh, particularly based on the EIA process uh, in, in Sri Lanka. How, yeah. how is it done and the community? I think um, I know EIA is a, the entire process of EIA is a, is a kind of, a, uh, you know, demanding for a permit to develop. It's a kind of a permit. It doesn't mean you can expect all these uh, good results. The team, you know, you know the process. Uh, who are the, the, when you're hiring a team to conduct environment assessment, actually paid by the client, the developer, not the government. So when you, the, I mean, when you pay by the client, so your responsibility is to have a positive EI rather than negative EI. That's their job. Otherwise, they don't pay you. So that is uh, how can say your plan is negative? No, that's that's there's a pos there's a possibility. So there are room for that to creating a mitigatory measures. So he has to EI has to study or uh, alternative things. Now you can understand EIA process public participation. What is it? It is actually the legal requirement. You have to keep the co three copies in three languages in the divisional secretary's office for a period of 60 days or 30 days, I can't, 30 days. After that, people can lodge complaint in writing. Sometimes there are no, I know I had an EIA, some of our staff, some of the staff members joined with me and in the Remula, we did the EIA and EIA actually only the, the no people, we are not coming, but the officers are commenting, but they, they actually, I found that there are some kind of over enthusiastic on the environment, not like the positive. He does it against if you are against with something, then then you always bias. So it is very you understand this the public parts, the way that happened is totally not correct. It should be have a mechanism. So the people there should be a mechanism you have to get the public uh, aware of what's going to first. Then they let the public to comment on this. There are we can, I mean, that's the way, but EIA process right now, it is not there, only the document available, nobody can read it, can understand, they are very highly technical, and they, they are not bothering about, they don't have time to attend this, only a few people are interested, parties and go represent, that's also not taken, because they are not uh, properly get that advice, so they are where we can get, so that is the issue. So I think uh, some some mechanism has to be yeah. I think the the some countries uh, is it, is a matter of that. If you are genuinely doing something, you don't worry about that. You are getting definitely a good result. So 
if you are going to hide something or do something, then definitely people are, you know, worry about that. I am telling you this, the road, uh, the all this road project, the problems came during the implementation, actually is a part of the EIA team, not the, the, not the people who are actually implementing. So therefore, the way I went wrong, because the professionals who did the EIA should, they, are, they should be competent to do that first. The public participant very important at the time of EIA. If you counted that particular tree, really you must count number of trees which are actually within that one by one and mark them, and then you found that particular the issue, the tree actually the made by the wildlife conservation department race about the Mirigama issue that came because of that indicate EIA has not taken that aspect. So. So you should not keep the room for that. So all actually have to be, because this is a guiding document, not to negative, but you can guide the development properly with that mitigating measures. Only public participation actually very technical, very limited to that particular documentation only. I think that's, that's a problem, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mohanam. So I think we are behind the schedule for half an hour now. So uh, I think uh, we will uh, wrap up the session uh, with the uh, audience Q&A as well. So I think maybe if you have any further com comments, any burning issues, you may be able to uh, drop an email to the organizing team or to me, and I can forward it to the uh, panel members. So uh, with that, uh, I think uh, if, I, if I wrap up the session, I think we started with the global perspective on uh, on the issue of environment justice and the sustainable development and what are associated with the environment justice and especially talking about climate change adaptation and how is it linking with the Sri Lankan context? What are the specific issues in the Sri Lankan context? So, and uh, with the environment justice, I think uh, uh, we talked about four key things, distribute channel justice, procedural justice, corrective justice, and social justice. I think there are four key ways, and I find this is linking exactly with Professor Mahanama uh, when it says about procedural justice, it is about the inclusiveness. So I think both speakers, they talk about a same thing in different ways that we should have inclusive planning, inclusive uh, development rather than excluding the other aspects, what we call these uh, social, economic and environment aspects. So that is the key message from the talk today. And I think the policy wise, Sri Lanka is in a strong position policy wise the policies are there the matter lies is implementing that policies there may be practical difficulties in implementing these policies but maybe as planners and maybe as young planners i think the key message is we should start from somewhere or maybe from individuals maybe from as individuals we may, we may be able to do something to support the sustainable development so I think that is the key message. It lies, and 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 most importantly, uh, we cannot, in 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 case we want to have sustainable development in developing countries, particularly in Sri Lanka, if we are to take the models exactly from USA, UK, EU, it will not work. That is what the the whole idea that we have to customize it to the to our context, to the Sri Lankan context. That is where the inclusiveness in urban planning comes in. So with that, I would like to wrap up this, this session and uh, to deliver the vote of thanks, I would like to invite Dr. Shanaka Kariyavasam, who is a senior lecturer of the Department of Town and Country Planning, University of Morotua. Shanaka, it's your time for the vote of thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, Nuan, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure that you all had a fruitful discussion uh, on environmental justice and sustainable development uh, this evening. Uh, now we have arrived uh, at the conclusion of this event. Uh, okay, uh, as majority of the audience are professional planners or so working to become planners, uh, I would like to bring uh, two key remarks uh, based on the speeches of Professor Mahanam and uh, Dr. Sumudhu Atapattu. Uh, the first one uh, is in line with the professional voice and opinions on current development affairs of the country. Now, uh, most of the examples that uh, Professor Mahanam brought uh, today had uh, at the time of the problem, uh, we had divided opinions uh, among the uh, people as well as among the professionals. Uh, a variety of perspectives is great, but uh, the problem is uh, when uh, 
different desires of political groups uh, come into the uh, table and uh, it, it uh, drags uh, people's views. Uh, so as planners, we have a role of uh, integrating uh, different aspects uh, on uh, development and uh, make some voice. Otherwise, uh, uh, non-professionals will uh, make voices and uh, mislead uh, the public. Uh, so misinformation has powers of changing governments as well as uh, destroying our future. Uh, so it is uh, timely needs uh, uh, positive change makers. Uh, so uh, as planners, we have a role to play there. And uh, my final remark is based on the advancement of professional career uh, and lifelong learning. Now, uh, when we look at the profiles of two speakers today, so both have continued uh, their uh, professional practice, education and research. Uh, so as, as planners, uh, so don't stop your desire on learning, research and professional practice on different specializations. Uh, now, uh, Professor Mahana talked about uh, new tools available uh, and uh, there are courses as well uh, now, under the COVID situation, there are many learning opportunities. Uh, so don't limit yourself to the conventional learning platforms as well as uh, conventional domains uh, like environment, economics, uh, and sociology. But uh, there are new areas like urban informatics. Uh, so uh, new areas are there. So uh, I, I uh, uh, request you all to uh, continue your your professional and uh, academic development uh, throughout your career. Uh, with those remarks, uh, I will proceed with the word of thanks. Uh, on behalf of the International Relations Committee of the ITPSL, my sincere gratitude uh, for uh, two speakers today, uh, Dr. Samudu Atapattu and Professor P.K.S. Mahanama, uh, for accepting our invitation and for the thoughts uh, they shared us with today. And uh, many thanks to our moderator, Dr. Nguan uh, Dias, and uh, the meeting host, uh, planner Malis Saniviratna. Uh, and uh, we are grateful to the executive council members of the ITPSL uh, for their support and guidance in coordinating this event. And uh, we would like to extend our gratitude uh, to the Center for Urban and Regional Planning, uh, known as CURP, uh, for their continuous support for the, from the beginning of this event. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank all the participants and the and everyone who supported us, uh, supported us in organizing this event uh, for their time and uh, other contributions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, good night to everyone.